Hi, this is the second lesson in electricity. Uh, I mainly focused on Edexcel, Cambridge and International Battery Rate Syllabuses. Uh, during my first lesson, I discussed two different equations. I equal uh, Q over T, that's the definition of electric current. And uh, then I discussed the transport equation, I equal NAEV. And also I discussed few questions uh, based on those equations. Uh, the URL, the link for the lesson one is given in the description part. Okay, uh, in this uh, lesson also I uploaded a worksheet uh, and also a brief notes uh, in the description part. You can download it from there. Okay, in this lesson, I uh, first focus on the difference between conductor, semiconductor, and insulator. Okay, in IGCSE, you distinguish them, the conductor, semiconductor, and insulator, based on the current flow. Uh, normally, in IGCSE, we say the material that conducts current very well is called conductor. The material which never conducts current is called insulator, and the material which conducts current somewhere between conductor and uh, insulator is called uh, semiconductor, is it? But here we uh, explain the difference between conductor, semiconductor, and insulator based on band theory. Okay, what is band theory? What is it? Band, actually, you know, according to Bohr model, on an electron, uh, sorry, on an atom, electrons are kept at different energy levels or different shells. Uh, we learned that under spectra in unit 2 in Edexcel, and we learned that in Cambridge and International Baccarat also. Uh, according to Bohr model, the nucleus will be at the center and the electrons are orbiting the nucleus at different energy levels or different shells, right? But when we talk about band theory, we group several millions of electrons from several millions of atoms. We group several atoms together and define two different energy levels by grouping several millions of atoms together, not one atom, several millions of atoms together and we define two different energy levels. They are valence band and conduction band. So the electrons in the valence band cannot move from one atom to another atom. They are not free. So electrons in the valence band are only in that band. They can't flow from one atom to another atom. But the electrons in the conduction band, they can flow from or jump from one atom to another atom, right? So when we think about these two energy levels, valence band and conduction band, uh, in conductors, the valence band and conduction band, the energy levels, they partially overlap. So the electrons in the valence band and conduction band, they partially overlap and conduction band is completely full. So there will be a lot of electrons in the conduction band. Those electrons can involve in the current flow. <coughs> When we think about the semiconductor, there's a gap between the valence band and conduction band. This gap is called forbidden gap. The gap between the valence band and conduction band, it's called forbidden gap. There will be less number of electrons in the conduction band, but you can excite the electrons from valence band to conduction band. How can we excite the electrons from valence band to conduction band? By heating the semiconductor. When we heat a semiconductor, the electrons will jump from valence band to conduction band. So the number of electrons in the conduction band will increase. The number of electrons in the conduction band will define or will give the charge carrier density. So according to I equal NAEV, the transport equation we learned in the first lesson, when you heat a semiconductor, N will increase. That is, the number of electrons in the conduction band will increase. So, current flow will increase. So, that's the reason you learned in IGCSE, when you heat a semiconductor, its resistance decreases because current increases. Why current increases? Electrons are excited from valence band to conduction band. Okay. But when we consider an insulator, the conduction band is empty. There are no electrons. So that means uh, an insulator won't have any delocalized electrons in the conduction band. All the electrons will stay in the valence band. The gap between the valence band and conduction band, that's a forbidden gap, is much larger. 
even by heating you can't excite any electrons from balance band to conduction band in insulators so that's the reason even when you heat an insulator it won't become a semiconductor or conductor okay because this band is empty there are no electrons in the conduction band for insulator all the electrons stays in the valence band by heating it also you can't excite electrons from valence band to conduction band uh, for insulators right but here you can excite electrons from valence band to conduction band so when you excite it the charge carrier density will increase so current flow will increase that means resistance decreases in the semiconductor in, in, in conductor they partially overlap and there will be a lot of electrons in the conduction band okay so normally they ask about uh, the past papers they ask about uh, what happened when you heat a electro uh, heat a conductor or semiconductor uh, what will happen to the current flow okay so what happens in conductors when you increase the temperature there is no change in electrons in the conduction band but when you increase the temperature the electrons gain energy and their kinetic energy will increase and the atoms will start to vibrate vigorously okay in conductors the atoms vibrate vigorously when the uh, temperature increases so the rate of flow of electrons can decrease due to the vibration of the atomic planes so in conductors what happens when the temperature increases there's no increasing number of electrons in the conduction band that is there is no increase in the charge carrier density but atoms are vibrating so the electrons have difficulty in jumping from one atom to another atom so when the temperature increases rate of flow of electrons will decrease because of the vibration of the atomic planes or vibration of the atoms will cause the rate of flow of electrons so in conductors when the temperature increases current flow will decrease okay so you should say what happens in conductors when the temperature increases there is no change in the charge carrier density or there is no change in the number of electrons in the conduction band but atoms absorb the thermal energy and they'll start to vibrate the atomic planes will vibrate due to the vibration of the atomic planes the rate of flow of electrons will decrease so current flow will decrease that means resistance will increase in conductors when the temperature increases when you think about semiconductor what happens when the temperature increase when the temperature increase here also the atoms will vibrate but at the same time electrons will be excited from valence band to conduction band so there are two different things happening in opposite way is it one is the vibration of the atoms atomic plates will cause disturbance for the flow of electrons but at the same time the charge carrier density increase because electrons are jumping from valence band to conduction band so they are they will cause opposite effects in the current flow one is supporting the current flow because increase in charge carrier density will increase the current flow but at the same time the vibration of the atoms will cause disturbance for the flow rate of flow of electrons right but when we think about overall effect the effect due to increasing charge carrier density is more even there is disturbance due to vibration of the atomic planes so in semiconductors what happens when the temperature increase in overall current flow will increase even though there is disturbance due to vibrations of the atomic planes current flow will increase so we can say resistance will decrease but in insulator there is no effect due to increase in temperature okay next about voltage or potential difference okay when we think about a circuit mainly right uh, to cause current flow through a component electrons must flow from one point to another point and work should be done on the electrons to move electrons from one point to another point say for example a simple circuit if you consider a back a cell and there's a resistor maybe there's a bulb right so to move electrons through this resistor work should be done on those electrons because resistor 
atomic planes, there will be resistance, they oppose the flow of electrons. So work should be done to move electrons from one point to the other point of the resistor. The same way to move electrons through the bulb, work should be done to move those electrons, right? So what is potential difference? Potential difference is how much of work is required to move one Coulomb charge from one point to the next point. So you know the current is flowing in this way. We will take it like this. The current is flowing this way. Electrons are flowing in this way. You learned that in IGCSC, electron flow and the current flow are opposite to each other, right? The current flow is opposite to the direction of flow of electrons. That's the conventional sign of current flow. So the electrons are flowing from this direction. So if one Coulomb charge, one Coulomb electrons wants to move from this point to this point through the bulb, work should be done on those electrons. So the amount of work required to move one Coulomb of charge through the bulb is defined as the potential difference across the bulb. Same way, the amount of work required to move one Coulomb of charge through the resistor is called or is defined as the potential difference across the resistor. Okay, so why we need work? Because when electrons are flowing through that, they will experience opposing force due to collision with the atomic planes and the other electrons. So work should be done on it. It's like something like a resistance for the flow of electrons. To overcome that, work should be done on them, right? So potential difference across a component is defined as work done per Coulomb, so work done over charge. Potential difference is denoted by capital V, work done W, charge Q, cross multiply, W equal QV. So the unit of work is joules, unit of charge is Coulomb, so the unit of potential difference will be joule per Coulomb. One joule per Coulomb is defined as one volt and denoted by capital V. Okay. Okay, next one is electromotive force. Electromotive force is something related to a power supply. It's a property of a power supply. Okay, what is it? The electromotive force of a power supply is defined as the total work done in moving one Coulomb charge through one complete circuit okay so we can here also we can consider a simple circuit so there is a bulb and there's a resistor and we consider a motor so all these three are connected in series okay so as i explained earlier about the potential the amount of work required to move one coulomb charge through the motor is the potential difference across the motor, I can call it as V1. Same way, the amount of work required to move one Coulomb charge through the resistor is the potential difference across the resistor, I can say it as V2. The amount of work required to move one Coulomb charge through the bulb is the potential difference across the bulb, I can call it as V3. Okay, all these work in moving one Coulomb charge through the motor through the resistor and through the bulb that the total work is done by the power supply. So the total work done by the power supply in moving one Coulomb charge through the complete circuit is called the electromotive force of the power supply. So you can ask me, you know, work is a scalar quantity. So the electromotive force, is it equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3? Yes, you are right. That is the equation called Kirchhoff's second law. I'll come to that point later. Okay. So electromotive force means the total work done in moving one Coulomb charge through one complete circuit. So that also looks the same form, right? Total work done over charge. So electromotive force is denoted by epsilon. That is like a 3 the other way, epsilon equal total work done W over Q. So W equal Q times EMF. Here also, here also the unit of electromotive force is same joule per coulomb. 1 joule per coulomb equal 1 volt. Okay. Okay, so it's a common question uh, came in the past papers. Unit of voltage is volt, right? 
volt in terms of base units. You know, volt is a derived unit. Okay, so how to write that? You know, volt is equal to joule per coulomb. Both joule and coulomb are derived units. Joule, I can write Newton meter. Is it according to uh, work equal force into distance? Joule, you know, work is equal to force into distance. You learn in mechanics. So, joule is equal to Newton meter. I can write Newton meter. Coulomb, you know, Q equal IT. So, there, this is a base unit. This is a base unit. Is it base quantity? This is a base quantity. Both are base quantities. So, instead of Coulomb, I can write ampere second both are base units ampere second to the power minus one okay i know ampere is a base unit second is a base unit meter is a base unit only newton is a derived unit okay so newton i can write by using f equal ma force is newton unit of force is newton mass is kilogram Acceleration is meter per second squared. You can see they all are base units, right? So in some newton, I can write kilogram meter second minus two times a minus one s minus one solid. You can see kilogram is a base unit, meter is a base unit, second is a base unit, and there is a base unit. So kilogram meter second minus two second minus one second minus three ampere minus one so this is the volt is a derived unit in terms of base units okay so next topic is electrical resistance what is electrical resistance so the electrical resistance is of a material is the ability to oppose the flow of electrons is it that's the Electrical resistability of the material or ability of the component to oppose the flow of electrons is the electrical resistance. But when we define electrical resistance, we define by using this equation. Okay, so the electrical resistance of a component is defined by this equation. Electrical resistance equal voltage across two points over current flow between those two points or so current flow through the component. Say for example, again I'll consider a simple circuit. Say this is the bulb and there is a resistor and there is a motor. Right. So what's the electrical resistance of the motor? We learned that earlier to move one coulomb charge through the motor work should be done on it. That is the voltage across the motor. Right. Same way to move one coulomb charge through the resistor, volt work should be done on it. That's the voltage across the resistor. Same way there's a voltage across the bulb also. Right. So if I say the current flow through the motor is I, then the resistance of the motor is V1 divided by I. That is the resistance of the motor. The volt voltage across the component or voltage across the two points. So the, what are the two points? These are the two points across the motor. Across the motor, there are two terminals. That is the voltage work done to move one coulomb charge from that point. This point is the voltage across the motor. So that voltage divided by the current flow through the motor gives the resistance of the motor. Same way, the voltage across these two points V2 is the work done in moving one coulomb charge from this point to this point through the resistor is the voltage across the resistor. That voltage divided by the current flow through the resistor gives the resistance of that component. Okay, so simply we say voltage across two points divided by current flow between those two points. Current flow between those two points gives the resistance between those two points. So resistance changes depending on the two points we consider. When we consider two points, we should consider the voltage across those two points divided by the current flow from one point to the next point. So that's the way resistance is defined. According to this definition, the unit of resistance is volt per ampere. But normally we don't use this one. One volt per ampere is defined as one ohm denoted by this one. 
Okay, so the next topic is resistivity. It's actually something related to property of a material. Okay, when we consider a wire, right, it can be a cylindrical shape wire or strip or rectangle shape, whatever it is. For a wire, the resistance of the wire. So what do you mean by resistance of the wire? Resistance across the two points of a wire is directly proportional to the length between those two points. Say, imagine I consider wire of length L. So I'm considering the resistance across the starting point and the final point of the wire. The length between those two points is L. The resistance is directly proportional to L. That means the wire is made of copper, imagine, and the cross-sectional area is A. Consider two different wires made of copper with the same area of cross-section. This is another wire, consider the same area of cross-section made of same material but different length. Larger the length, greater the resistance. Why? When electrons flow through longer distance, they will have more collisions with the atom. So more work should be done to overcome the opposing force. So larger the length, greater the resistance. You learned that in IGCSE also when the length of a wire increases, uh, resistance will increase because there will be more collisions for the electrons to overcome when they travel through longer distance. So R directly proportional to L. Then next one is the resistance is inversely proportional to the area of cross-section. That means thicker wire will have less resistance. Why? Thicker wire will have more path for the electrons to flow. You know, wider road, there can be many cars at the same time. Narrow road, there can be only few cars can flow. You can make it as an analogy. The same way, thicker wire has more path for the electrons to flow. So larger the area of cross-section, lower the resistance. Now, when I combine these two equations, I can write R proportional to L over A. Practically, we can find a constant for a type of material. Now, if I convert this into equation, there will be a constant. When I convert this proportional to an equation, there will be a constant. That e constant is called resistivity denoted by rho. R equal rho L over A. This rho is the property of the material called resistivity. For a particular type of material at constant temperature, rho is constant. For example, for conductors, when the temperature increases, rho will increase. I told that already when the temperature increases, resistance of conductor increases due to atomic vibrations. Why it increases? Because rho increases. It's actually intrinsic property of the material. For semiconductors, when the temperature increases, rho will decrease because you know that resistance decreases. Okay, so I can write rho is equal to, it's a property of the material called resistivity, rho equal Rk over L. So the unit of rho, unit of R is ohm, unit of rho, R is M, the unit of area is meter squared, unit of length is meter, so uh, rho, so uh, the unit of rho will be ohm meter. That's the unit of resistivity. Okay, so how if they ask to define resistivity, we can define like that, but that definition they never asked in Excel, but Capes they can ask. We can define what is resistance means. When we consider one unit of length of wire, which has one area of cross section, one meter squared area of cross section, then its resistance will be equal to resistivity for a one meter length of wire. If the area of cross section is one meter square, so I make both one, one, then I can say the resistance of that wire will be equal to resistivity. That's the way we define the resistivity. Okay. Okay, so the next topic is electrical power. So you know electricity is a form of energy. So electrical power. is defined as work done over time. So that means electrical work done 
divided by time. The rate of electrical work done is defined as electrical power. So here we can consider two different powers. Say for example, one, the first one is power consumed by an electrical component or power dissipated by a component. Say for example, when you consider electrical bulb, it consumes electrical power and dissipate the same amount of power in the form of light and heat or in terms of energy if I say it consumes electrical energy and give out dissipate both light and heat okay so if you think about electric heater it consumes electrical power or electrical energy and dissipate it as a heat 100 percent heat right so electrical power consumed by a component or electrical power dissipated total electrical power dissipated by a component is given by work done over time work done is w equal qv we know work done w equal qv we learned that in this lesson so it's a work done i can write qv over t where q is the amount of charge flown through the component V is the potential difference across the component divided by time. This I can write Q over T into V. That is charge flown per unit time. That is current I V. That is power equal V times I. The first equation. That's the power dissipated by a component or power consumed by a component. But I know V equal I R. I got it from the definition of resistance, R equal V O I. If I make the V subject, V equal I R. So replace V by I R. So I'll get P equal I R into I. That is P equal I squared R. So same equations with different quantities. Here power in terms of potential across the component and current through the component. This is just square of the current through the component and the resistance of the component. Same way I know I equal V over R. So P equal is V into instead of I I can write V over R. So P equal V square over R. So all these three equations give the power consumed by a component or power dissipated by a component. There's one more equation about power given out by a power generated by a power supply. Power generated by a power supply, that is a different equation. Uh, it cannot be derived, it's given by power generated by a power supply, is given by EMF of the power supply. I already defined the EMF. EMF of the power supply into current flow through it. So this is the power generated by a power supply. This are, these three equations are power consumed by a component or power dissipated by a component. Okay, so in this lesson, we learned several equations. I'll summarize it now. Okay, in the first lesson, we learned two equations, Q equal IT. That's from the definition of current and the second one, transport equation, I equal NAEV. So in second lesson, we learned more equations and they are first equation W equal the work done, electrical work done equal amount of charge flown through the component into the potential difference across the component. We got this equation from the definition of potential difference. Then we learned about electromotive force. That's the total work done by the power supply in moving one coulomb charge through one complete circuit. So that is given by W equal Q times EMF. Then we learned about resistance of a component. V equal IR. So that is R equal V over I. From that we got V equal IR. Then resistance of a component depends on the properties of the resistance of a wire depends on the properties of the wire length and area of cross section. So resistance of a wire given by R equal rho L over K. Then we learned about the electrical power. Just now I wrote it. Electrical power consumed by a component is given by P equal V I or I squared R 
or b squared over r. Then the power generated by a power supply is given by emf times current. So these are the equations so far we learned in electricity. Okay, so uh, during my next lesson, third lesson, I will discuss few questions related to uh, these equations. Okay, so that's the end of uh, second lesson. Bye.